The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. In Sao Paulo, there are many, many wonderful Sephardic Yidin. And they have an organization, about two organizations called Shalom. They were having a 10th anniversary dinner, and they asked me to be the guest speaker. After the dinner, somebody comes over to me, a guy, Charles Abalafia, and he says to me, Rabbi, I got to tell you a great story that you're going to print. Now, I hear that every day and twice on Sunday. And not only that, usually when somebody tells it to me, after they tell me the story, he says, you want to know how to print my name, how to spell my name? Right? Isn't that what happened tonight at the restaurant? <laughs> okay. But anyway, so what happened is, it was a great story. It's amazing. Charles Abalafia tells me that 10 years ago, he was not as frum as he is today. Because today, because of the Shalom Kirov organization, he became much frumer. But he was somewhat frum. He was Shemesh Shabbos, but his parents were not frum. And they had a home in a very fancy area called Guaruja, which is 75 miles away from Sao Paulo. And they call him one Friday morning. They said, Charles, we'd like you to come for Shabbat. Now, we know that you're observant. There's a synagogue not far. It's an Orthodox synagogue. Come to Guaruja, and you'll be with us for Shabbat, and you'll be able to pray in your synagogue. So he told me, it's very, very dangerous in Sao Paulo. You cannot even walk into a shul from the outside. You walk into like a little cubicle, and they video you, and you're locked on both sides. And once you get the okay, then they'll snap open the other door for you. Same thing in an apartment building, same thing in any school. There's no such thing. You just walk in to a building in Sao Paulo. And there's no major highway going down to Guarujá. It's only one lane this way, one lane that way. Nobody would dare stop on a highway because they could be carjacked or killed or robbed. So, of course, he made sure that he had enough gas to get there. But he didn't realize that he had to check his tires also. So after 60 miles, he got a flat tire. Now, there's only favelas, which they call slum areas. Now, he stops on the highway. He says, Hashem, please, I don't want to be Mechala Shabbat. I don't want to lose my life. What should I do? I can't get out of this car. Nobody stops for him. So he had to get out of the car. And of course, nobody was going to stop because they thought he's like a ruse. He's just trying to, you know, kill somebody else. So after a few minutes, he decides, listen, it's getting close to Shabbos. He's got to go. So he gets into his car. He drives very slowly for a minute. And he goes into one of these slum areas. The second he comes with his nice car into the slum areas, all the little boys and the girls, the cats and the dogs and the guys without the shirts, you know, his real low lives. They come over to him. What are you doing here? They're all speaking in Portuguese. That's the language. He says, look, I, I got a flat tire. I got to get to Guadalajara before sunset. Could somebody help me fix the flat? Nobody could help him. They tried. There wasn't going. So he told me he saw an old car, like a 30-year-old car. He said, whose car is this? The guy without the shirt says, it's mine. Why? He says, look, I trust you. I'm going to leave my car here. I know it's a good car. I'm leaving it here till Sunday. Get me, come with me in that car. Drive me. I'll pay you anything you want. Just get me to Guadalajara before sunset. So they make a deal. And the guy says, okay, let me get my shirt. He says, there's no time. Get into the car. We got to go right away. So now he's driving with this guy without a shirt. And they're flying down the last 15 miles to get to, to get to uh, Guadalajara. Now he figures he's got to explain something to him. He says, listen. Turned out he had the same first name, Charles. He said, listen, Charles. You probably never saw a Jew in your life. But I just want to explain to you, I'm Jewish. And we believe that God created the world in six days. On the seventh day, we have to rest. It begins Friday night. So I got to get to Guadalajara before sunset. So the driver without the shirt says, Oh, you don't think I know what a Jew is? I'm not Jewish, but my mother's Jewish. Wow. He said, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Now, he didn't want to tell him that meant that he's Jewish. He thought I'd throw him out of the car. He said, what do you mean your mother's Jewish? He said, you know, my mother was born in Holland at the end of the 1930s. And when she was eight years old, the Germans started making trouble for Jews. So my grandparents, they got out of there. I took a look it up. There were boats that came from Holland to Brazil. And they landed in Santos, which is right next to Guadalajara. It's a Christian city. They didn't want to have any connection to Judaism. They put her in a Christian school, in a Catholic school. And she was raised Catholic. She married a Catholic. And all of us are all Catholic. She's Jewish. He says, he says, I, 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 can't, I can't believe it. He says, your mother's still alive? She says, yeah, she's in a hospital in Santos. She's dying. She's very sick. Now, what would you say if you heard that statement? You're driving with a guy without a shirt. The guy tells you his mother's dying. Now you realize that she's maybe Jewish. What would you say? Most of us would say, God should help her. She should be well. That's not what he said. You know what he said? Could I go visit her Sunday morning? The guy almost fell out of the car. You want to visit my mother? You don't even know her. No, but you said she's Jewish. And I'm Jewish. 
So if she's Jewish and I'm Jewish, Jewish people take care of each other. I feel I should go visit her. And after that, I'll come to pick up my car. He said, you're amazing. I don't believe it. He says, I just want to tell you, it's a very dumpy hospital. She's on the third floor, bed number 10, but it's awful. He says, it's okay, I'll go. And he takes him, he gets him there before sunset, and Charles Abelafi is such a sensitive guy. He told me, I felt so bad that this guy was driving back now because he was driving on Shabbos. Now I know he's a Yid. What was I going to tell him? Sunday morning, he comes into the hospital. He walks into the third floor, bed 10, says, excuse me, are you Maria? She says, how do you know? She says, I met your wonderful son, Charles. He did very nice things for me. He brought me to Guadalajara before sunset. And they get into a whole conversation. And then he says, you know, your son told me you're Jewish. Is that true? She said, why did he tell you that? She said, because I told him that I'm Jewish. And he told me that you're Jewish. She said, yeah, it's true. He says, Maria, do you remember anything from your youth about being Jewish? Listen to what she says. She closes her eyes and she starts saying in perfect Hebrew, Baruch Ata Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Ha'ilon, Asher Kiddushonu, B'Mitzvaysa B'Tzivonu. And before she can say the words, L'Had Leknesh al Shabbat, she starts crying and she cannot stop crying. She hasn't cried like that in years. And she's crying and crying and she can't get out these words. And finally he says, how do you know that? And she says, L'Had Leknesh al Shabbat. She says, my abuela, my grandmother used to light candles with me every Friday night. I loved it. She says, you think I believe anything that they taught me? They forced me to go to those Christian schools. I believe in only one God. All these years, I only believe in one God, but they forced me to go to those schools. And they forced me to marry who I married. But I only believe in one God. And he said to her, Maria, I want to be your friend. Promise me that when you get out of this place, you're going to call me and I'll come visit you. And two weeks later, she called him. She was home. And he went and he told me there was a big cross right on our front door. He couldn't believe it. So when he goes inside, after the kids left, he said, Maria, you told me you're Jewish. How come you have a cross on your door? She says, you think I want it? Could you take it away? Take it away and get rid of it. He says, you really want me to take it away? She says, yeah. And I think of him every day when I say Elena. He told me when he took it into the car and he broke it, he felt he was being Makayim Lahavi Gilulim in Oretz. Right? When do we ever get a chance? And you know what? She died a few days later. And Rabbi David Cohen told me an amazing thing when I told him this story. He said, look at the Avas Yisrael of this guy. What would we have done? Would we even think to visit this lady? But because he was Mavaka Choylaher, he got her to proclaim once again that she believes in Hashem Echad. And who knows, said Rabbi David, maybe before she died, before she closed her eyes the final time, maybe she said, one more Shema Yisrael. Because now she was brought back to Tshuva. How does that happen? Because a Yid cares about another Yid. What would we say to somebody who's married to a guy who's got eight children, they're all Goyim, so to speak. Of course they're Yid. But that's what happens when you care about another Yid. That's what happens when you're proud of your own Yiddishkeit. You're not afraid to meet other people. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire dot org.